I see you as a global citizen, you know, and, and but I don't think Americans generally are. And, and I think that, uh, you know, you're talking about unconscious bias. You know, it's interesting. I think if you went to China and you spent some time talking about film, anybody in China would tell you, oh, I know who Steven Spielberg is. But spend time here in the United States. Zhang Yimou, who's yeah, that? And he's a phenomenal director. Mm. How do you ever get past that? And I'm sure that keeps you up at night, Slowly right? Slowly but surely. I think things are changing, and I think they're changing for a lot of reasons. First of all, culture, I do believe, follows economics to some degree. And I think the rise of China's economy has really opened up people's eyes. I mean, it is a necessity. If you're a large corporation, whether film or otherwise, you can't ignore the China market. So that's been a big uh, boost to the kind of enlightenment of people in, in this industry. Um, streaming has helped a lot too because eyeballs anywhere in, around the world are important to Netflix or Amazon. Social media has helped. We no longer have to spend tons of money. The whole infrastructure of the old Hollywood has changed to our benefit. When I say our, those of us who want to be global citizens because there isn't th this idea that you have to gather all these people to an opening weekend, you know, get the babysitters and get the, you know, do the parking and then spend massive amounts of money to make sure people are going there. That's a very old system. And that only works these days for very, very, very big movies where you can afford to spend $100 million on marketing. So what about everything else? This idea also that people don't want to see subtitled movies, well, that was the case. Recently, there was this movie, The Farewell, which is 85% of Mandarin. People went. Yeah. I mean, it's a small movie, but uh, they didn't seem to be bothered by it. Joy Luck Club 2, that was easily 25, 30% in Mandarin Chinese. Didn't seem to bother people. So it's a lot of, a lot of it is, I think, is how it's marketed and the perception of what it is. So people are having to get over the hamps. And I think this younger generation, they're surfing the net, they're traveling everywhere. It's just less of an obstacle. It was definitely a, a, a obstacle. It was one of the just, you know, non-negotiable things. No foreign language films work, right? That was the, the common wisdom. Someone had asked you about Chinese censorship. There's always this view in the mm. West that the Chinese, they're just... And you said there are different forms of censorship. There's economic censorship, which Hollywood mm. exercises. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard anyone put it that way. Talk to me about that. The second you take a dollar you lose an ounce of freedom and that is how Hollywood works the bigger your budget the more control they have so we're used to somebody editing or or having some say some control over what we make it's never in a, in a vacuum you never just get to do whatever you want right somebody has to approve it somebody has to say this is a good investment or this jives with my taste and I think this or whatever. It's never just a pure, like nobody's watching. Somehow people think, oh, in China, you've got to, you know, you, you, there's all these people who have a say in what you're doing. Everywhere that's the case. Everywhere, all over, anywhere you shoot in the, in the world. Hollywood whitewashing refers to the U.S. film industry's common practice of casting white actors to play characters who are traditionally non-white. Since the beginning of American filmmaking, white actors have filled Asian roles, and it's still happening to this day. Although now the practice is met with much more public outcry, particularly on social media. So whitewashing, I know, yeah. is such an issue, and some of the excuses from Hollywood just must just get your blood boiling. Uh, talk to me about that. Yeah, it's really an old system and an old set of beliefs that has a lot to do with star power, right? So this is the, the, the vicious cycle. It's like, how do you make a star? Well, you have to give them roles that are starring roles, but if you don't do that, then there's no stars. We, had, we really had no Asian stars for the longest time. You could count on one hand for decades and decades and decades. Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, um, Lucy Liu, you know, that's, who else? Joan Chen sort. I mean, they, we had no stars. And Joy Luck Club, they kept saying, how did you cast Joy Luck Club? Where did everybody come from? I said, well, you don't need to cast stars. We could have cast 10, 20, 30 Joy Luck Clubs. There's, there's really good actors. So people 
really got too attached to this idea that we need a star to open a movie. And if a role called for it you know, was an, it was written as Asian, well, we better just put a we'll put a star in that role and pretend that Scarlett Johansson or Emma Stone or whatever. I think they both feel a little embarrassed about it now. Emma Stone at one point, she was she mouthed. There was some discussion at one of the awards shows, and she mouthed to, to the screen. She's like, I'm "Sorry," <laughs> you know. She played this Hawaiian girl. So that was the thinking: is that we have to have a star, and that was more important than anything. And it didn't matter that it was very implausible that they would be, you know, playing a Japanese woman or whatever. So that that just it's just bad habits that evolved over decades, and people just got stuck with these bad habits. I think it's just not okay anymore, and I, I feel like we're we're past that now, fortunately. The Oscars So White hashtag was created in 2015 and went viral after the Academy Awards, also known as the Oscars, selected only white nominees in its leading and supporting acting categories. I don't know if you were in the audience or watching it at home. You must have wanted to throw something at the it television. Was, was, what was that like? It was shocking. It was shocking because there was so much anticipation, particularly that year, which was the hashtag Oscar So White year. and where there was so much discussion about racial sensitivity and they hired Chris Rock. And it was, it was shocking. And I was stunned at first. And, I, I, and then later that night or the next day, a couple of friends emailed and said, you know, did you see that? We should. And I, I actually started writing an editorial. I was showing it to some friends. I said, and somebody said, oh, I could maybe help get you this place somewhere. And then somebody suggested we should, other Academy members suggested we should do a group letter. I was like, oh, that's an even better idea. I don't want it to be just me that, you know, thinks this is outrageous. So we did this whole group letter. And that really was the birth in my mind of a movement because that letter did go viral. And um, we ended up having a meeting with Academy leadership. I had been an Academy member for many years, but never was involved per se. So uh, I happened to know the CEO and... I wrote her this email. I said, there's a lot of us that are really unhappy about this. Maybe we can have a meeting. And she said, absolutely, come in. And that meeting was the beginning of, of what I see as really turning the battleship around from the standpoint of the Asian American community. They had already decided that they were going to start this A2020 initiative to double the number of women and people of color. They were just talking about it. So the timing was perfect. And I guess they tapped me to then sit on all these different committees. But... Their intentions were very sincere, and they they set goals. We were invisible. We were invisible. We were silent. We were not heard. The fact that the uh, media, both traditional and and, and uh, digital, started reporting on what was happening with the academy, I did not expect that at all. I was like, they've never reported on the Asian American experience. That was just never happened before. So that led to other things. It led to a lot of people speaking up. You know, Daniel De Kim started talking about gay parody on his show Hawaii Five O, and then and then Crazy Rich Asians came out, and so many things converged in this moment in the, in the year 2018, particularly 2017, 2018. The 2016 Oscars was when that happened. So we were doing a lot of work behind the scenes. That led to a galvanizing of a movement, and then the final wonderful you know, icing on the cake was having a blockbuster movie, which finally, and for many people, this will be the only thing that makes them wake up is, you know, money. So finally, it's like, oh, we have to pay attention. But, you know, whatever it takes, right? And I'm just glad that we had that. The African-American community had their Black Panther and women had Wonder Woman. You know, it takes something big and obvious sometimes uh, for for people to just go, oh, okay, I get it now. <laughs> One word that stands out in your last comment was the word invisible. And it was so invisible that in many respects, this community wasn't even aligned. They, I mean, you didn't even know a lot of that. You guys kind of came together yes. not even knowing each other, right? Exactly, I mean, exactly. Exactly. We wouldn't know how to find each other before. It was, we were just sort of scattered. We were lost among Caucasians, basically. We were, you know, camouflaged. And then suddenly, because it, it really taught me a lot. I, I did not, again, say I'm going to try to build a movement. No, I was just doing what I thought was right and, um, and important. But it's so many other people were also doing and thinking the same thing. 
that we just managed to, to all converge and on so many different levels. And it's been, it has really been shockingly, gloriously uh, satisfying. American film executives are in fact paying attention. Currently, the Chinese government has a strict quota of allowing 34 foreign films to be shown in its theaters every year. But another way American film studios are getting their movies in front of Chinese audiences and bypassing the strict quota is through co-productions with Chinese film companies. What's that? The highest grossing US-China co-production was the 2018 sci-fi action film, The Meg earning $530 million worldwide. Other recent collaborations included Kung Fu Panda 3 and Abominable. I wish Dad were here to see this. Chinese filmmaking is expanding its reach in similar ways through investing in American studios and movies. For example, Chinese giant Alibaba and its longtime rival Tencent have both bankrolled American films like Mission Impossible and Star Trek Beyond. The current moment in film for both countries shows new opportunities for building collaborations and winning global audiences. Ken, do you ever see yourself as a bridge? I mean, in many ways you are, aren't you? I, I have uh, come to the realization that I am a bridge. I can't say that even I went in thinking about it that way, but the very thing that drew me was, I'm sure, to try to integrate the different parts of my life. And there, by doing that, I'm hoping that other people have that same experience because the world, you know, it was such a startling thing for me to feel very minimized growing up in a, a very, very white community and then going to China, suddenly being a majority and realizing, oh, it's the whole world out here. It's like, how do these two ever come together? And the perception, we talked a little bit about this earlier, the perception that Chinese have of Americans and vice versa, you know, it seems like sometimes there's a there's an impossible gap to bridge, but now I feel like that bridge, that gap is being bridged, and and I only I think in retrospect have I realized that oh yes this is what has been driving me. I was looking for good stories. I was looking for stories that that I related to that you know that were just humanistic and that generally defy stereotypes. You know, that generally cause people to have paradigm shifts. That's what's exciting to me. It's creating a little bit of that change in, in somebody's mind about, you know, their perception of something that's underrepresented people. So, so yeah, but the, the, the language about all this diverse and inclusive entertainment has only become very, very popular recently. I think I was doing it without realizing, you know, this sort of sociological sort of aspect of it um, at first. It just was what drew me. It was what I was attracted to. In 2015, I was at an event and I introduced a film from China, uh, Go Away, Mr. Tumor. I don't know oh, if you yes. ever saw that film. Yes. But after it was over, I mean, it was such a heart-wrenching, just a great story on so many different levels. I felt like, oh, this is a fantastic film. But then I felt after that, this is so sad that American audiences aren't exposed to this, right. aren't watching films right. like this. Um, with Roma and its success... Yeah that yeah. people could sit through a movie yeah. and it's all subtitled. Yeah. Do you think that kind of turned the corner too and that maybe someday a Chinese film might be well, a celebrated in that a way? A movie that is getting a lot of attention this year, not Chinese, but Korean. It's called Parasite by Bang Joon-ho. Um, it does seem to have a lot of sort of Oscar fairy dust on it right now. And, uh, and I do believe, you know, this is one area I, I have to say that is particularly sad China, China's submission for Oscars each year is misguided. <laughs> I mean, their their choices are being made on criteria that are not the, the necessarily the most helpful to them, right? So that may be your next job, <laughs> <laughs> advisor. So, so a lot of wonderful films do get lost in the shuffle every year. I do this U.S. China or U.S. Asia Entertainment Summit. So last year, and we have brought over Zhang Yimou. And you know, and his film Feng Xiaogang, who had that film that year, um, that was beautiful. The name of which escapes me right now. With the, with the ballet dancer and what? And last year we had Xu Zheng and his movie Dying to Survive, which is, by the way, a great translation of Wu Yashan. It was an amazing movie, and and precisely because 
and, and this person is a multi-talented, he's a, he's a director, producer, writer, and actor, and multi-talented on so many levels. And I'm going to put him in front of an audience, and they're all going to kind of not know exactly who he was. So at the last minute, I had uh, a friend of mine, Billy Bob Thornton, watch his movie, because they're very, in my mind, they're very similar, because they're sort of popular heroes. So he, he saw the film, he loved it, and just hearing him talk about the film to the audience, they thought that was so much more satisfying because they almost needed an interpreter, someone, someone they could relate to, as opposed to this totally foreign person, you know, talking about his movie. So that worked out really, and I think sometimes, and I think a lot about that, we need, we need people to bridge, again, bridge the gap. And um, you're doing it. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you too.